What a day, huh? You glad you're here? Man, wasn't that music phenomenal? Thank you, band, tech team, for leading us in that. Man, I feel like I could just go home now, don't you? Not a chance. Well, welcome. Uh, if you're online, joining us wherever you are in the world, we're glad that you've joined us. I'm Dennis. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a great day here. And uh, wherever you're listening to this, or whenever you're listening to this, I'm going to give you a quote, and then I want you to give me physically, I want you to give me the thumbs up if you like it, the thumbs down if you don't like it, all right? Not whether or not it's true, but whether or not you like it. So here's the quote, before the truth sets you free, it tends to make you miserable, all right? How many of you like that quote? Whoa, not many. The first service was about half and half. And the reason why those of you who did like it, like it, is because you're focusing on the first half. You understand, we understand, that the truth sets us free. We are free to live wholeheartedly. And that's a good way to live. How many of you didn't like it? Uh, some of you are kind of non-committal here. You're kind of thinking about it. That's fine. But if you, if you don't like it, here's, here's why. It's because very often the truth that we need to hear rubs up against us. And we might not want to hear the hardness of it or the challenge of it. And as Pastor Ryan taught us last week, a lot of times we avoid or ignore listening to the voices that we find very difficult to hear. And here's the tension. You see, for those of us who even have a mild curiosity about Jesus, th here's the tension. There's a Jesus that we want. We want this Jesus. We've met this Jesus in our Lenten journey, if you've been following through with some of these messages, uh, the daily messages especially that we get that Katie's been preparing. Like, we've been invited in. Oh, that's a great message. Or we belong. Nothing more warm than that message. Or we're the beloved. That's awesome. And we love that part of the message. In fact, our anchor verse for this series Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The Lord's acts of mercy are not exhausted. His compassion is not spent. They are renewed each morning, and as, as our series says, again and again and again. There's a Jesus that we want. And then there's the Jesus that we get and maybe don't want. It's a part of the spiritual journey that we prefer to ignore or avoid we might, in fact, get defensive or even argumentative about it. I don't want to face a false belief. Or I don't want to tamp down that self-driven ego that keeps rising up in me. I don't want to confront a value. I don't want to stand up for this cause or that group of people because of my, some of my friends or people in my church or my family won't like it. Or sometimes, if you're like me, we just get weary of the struggle and we want to just keep things the way they are. There's a Jesus that we want, and there's the Jesus that we get. There might be an issue in a relationship, and we know the truth about it. We know we need to bring it up to begin to talk about it, to begin to deal with it, maybe to get help, but before the truth is going to set us free, it's really going to make us miserable. Or there might be an old, stale grudge against the person or even against the situation. And it's like this big weed that we've allowed to grow up in the middle of our heart, and it's just so much difficulty and work to dig it up by the roots. And there's just enough justice in the weed to justify, just let it grow. Let it grow. Or there might be some discomfort with the otherness of some people. Who's in? Who's out? What do they have to stop doing or start doing in order to belong? There's a fence or a wall where there needs to be a bridge. Or there might be some belief about the Bible or God or Jesus that needs re-examining, that needs to grow and expand, but that's going to require some unknowing, some disruption in order to move to something larger and more loving and more aligned with reality. We're a lot like this reading that you'll get to if you're following our, our uh, devotional guide from again and again. It's called Flipping the Tables. I woke up and realized I was sitting at a table that oppression built. The patriarchy made the food. Cheap labor sold the tablecloth. The guest list 
was exclusive. Fear was the host. And the people seemed happy, but the food tasted awful because milk and honey are reserved for God's promised day. So hold on to your silverware because now that I see it, I can't unsee. The table is about to be flipped. And that reading references one of the most head-scratching incidents from Jesus' life because we meet a Jesus that is quite disturbing. The story is often called the cleansing or the clearing of the temple. And all four of the biographies of Jesus, we call them the Gospels as a group, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all include this story. John, the writer John, is the only one that puts this story at the beginning of Jesus' public life. So in chapter 1, John introduces us to Jesus in very broad strokes. And then in chapter 2, he records two stories, very contrasting stories. One of them is about a private wedding party that Jesus attended in a little podunk town. And the other one is, is a huge deal. It, it's Jesus attends the most sacred and religious place in all of the planet, the temple, at the most important religious festival in Jewish life, the Passover, in the most strategic city in all of Jerusalem, in all of Israel, named Jerusalem, and that drew the largest crowds ever to this particular event. In fact, historians estimate that 250,000 people crammed into Jerusalem, who had a, which had a normal population of 50,000 people. And in chapter 2, John tells us these two stories. Very contrasting, but they put, he puts them together to create a composite picture of Jesus for us. In the first story, Jesus miraculously turns water into wine at a private wedding party in a little podunk town called Cana. And apparently, at the reception, things got a little out of hand, and people drank all the wine. Now, to run out of wine at a Jewish wedding is the ultimate social faux pas. I mean, there would be Twitter messages just going out. I can't believe they ran out of wine. Facebook would be lighting up. It'd be all kinds of trending things going on on YouTube about the fact that this groom offended the entire wedding party by running out of wine. And Mary sees this happening. And so she comes up to Jesus and she says, Jesus, this is about to get real embarrassing for the groom. Do your thing. And so Jesus miraculously turns 100 to 150 gallons of water into the best wine money could buy. And I know what you're thinking. How do I get this Jesus to come to my next party? Then John tells, after that story, he tells this story, which I'm going to read, verses 13 to 17. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those he sold doves, he said, who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. In the wine story, Jesus is the ultimate party maker. In the whip story, Jesus is the ultimate party crasher. In the wine story, Jesus acts quietly and privately. In the whip story, it's public. It's dramatic. The party goes on and on into the night. In the whip story... Jesus throws things out. There's chaos and disruption. In the wine, he actually acts like he owns the place. In the wine, with a force. You see, there's a Jesus that we want, and we are attracted to, and we love. John wants us to make this very clear. It's the same. But it's the same Jesus who forcefully and passionately wrong. Jesus loves us, so us there. His love compels us to live more and more in that love. This highest and most holy Jewish festival called the Passover, the city of liberation and freedom, mind, at the center of their religious life in the temple, at the only presented are being misrepresented, misapplied, corrupted, and in fact used to oppress other people. 
consistent with the character of Jesus. Jesus acts passionately and forcefully. They're not the enemy. I mean, some of them thought yours. Luke records this, that before Jesus ever entered into and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And in Matthew, we hear other words under her wings. And you were not willing. And the tears are rolling down Jesus' cheeks as he weeps about Jerusalem because they're missing it. And so he weeps. This happens before he goes into the temple. And here's my point. There's a time to cry and there's a time to act. And if we haven't wept before we act in a forceful and passionate way, we're not ready to act yet. Because our act, people say, oh, really? What about the whip? I mean, there's some violence, isn't there? And people have used this passage of Scripture to justify violence. Let me tell you about the whip, all right? It says Jesus made it on sight. And this isn't one of those big, long leather reeds. Apparently, there might have been a basket weaver. It's really a marketplace in the, in the church here. A basket weaver making baskets. That's the kind of reed that Jesus, he made this whip out of fat plant leaves. Nobody was, just the point is, nobody's afraid of this passion of the whipper. And I tried to think, how do I, what, what would that look like today? How does this look? And so the closest thing I could think of is an illustration as a parent. Four kids. Let's say you have a, a child that's just gone kinds. And, and you've, you've, you've talked with them. They, they don't see it. They don't admit it. You've tried to talk them out of it. You've tried all the stuff that you can as a parent. And one night, they grab the car keys, and you realize they've been drinking way too much, and you hear them grab the keys off the kitchen table. What do you do as a parent? And, and this is a child where you've, you've cried over this situation. You've wept tear, buckets of tears. You've worn the carpet out at night waiting for them to call, call or to come home, maybe afraid of the phone call you're going to get. That's how this child has been. And now they're headed out to do something that's likely to hurt them or other people. What do you do? Here's what you do. You flip their table. You get in their face. You raise your voice. I mean, you don't hit them, punch them, throw them on the ground, call them a bunch of ugly names. Not that. But you turn over their table. You grab the keys. You lock the car. You might even call the police. But whatever it is, you've got to turn over that table, not out of fear, not out of anger, not out of hate, actually out of love because you have this desire to stop this self-destructive pattern and there's a time to flip over table. So here's two questions. What table is Jesus turning over in my life with more force and more passion than I'm comfortable with? And then think about the fact that if that's Jesus who's doing it, he's been weeping over this for you or for me. Because Jesus doesn't act in ways that doesn't touch his heart. And I, am I able to see that table flip as the love of Jesus? And the second question is, where do I need to be more forceful and passionate? Out of love. Are there tables in my relationship? in relationships, in our community that I need to turn over for the sake of other people? Have I wept about that yet? And the question is, why does Jesus act so forcefully and passionately? I mean, what is it this about what's going on that prompts this? There's three reasons. Here's the first one. The prophet of religion had replaced the practice of worship. John says that the money changers in animal sale barn were taking the place right there in the temple. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the marketplace. Right? In this case, the, in order for true temple worship to happen, money changers and the animal sellers were fulfilling a very practical purpose in their religious system. Now, we have to note, Jesus is about to shut down the whole religious system once and for all, but I'll get to that in a minute. You see, all the Jews were required to pay a temple tax in Jewish currency. Every time they came, they had to pay a tax. We're actually thinking of instigating that here at Crossroads. We think that really helped the budget. But anyway, and they're, but they're in a very uh, 
cosmopolitan country. People from our cultures, all kinds of currencies were being used in the economies of the country. So if you came and, uh, to the temple, you had to give the temple tax in Jewish currency. So be like us here at Crossroads. So maybe you all would bring a Brazilian dollar. You all would bring a Mexican peso. You all would bring some Ethiopian burr. You all might bring some Canadian money. And we were going to take up the offering. And we go, hey, we only take American money. All right? And so we'd set up tables here in here. And so when you came in for the service, you could just go up and exchange your money. So when you got to the offering, you could give it in American currency. That's what was going on. Fulfilled a very practical purpose. And the animal market had a similar purpose. Very practical thing. At Passover, people were asked to bring or required to bring an offering. If you were very poor, it was an offering of grain. If you were a little wealthier, it was pigeons or doves. Or if you were a little wealthier, it was a sheep. A little wealthier, it was a cow or a calf. And many people came from miles around, even internationally, to celebrate the Passover. Well, I'll ask you this. Is it easier to bring money for a calf 60 miles or bring the calf 60 miles? Yeah, you get it. Again, it fulfilled a very practical purpose. So there wasn't anything wrong with that. Here's the two things that were wrong. John points out the first one he, in verse 16. He says, stop turning my house into a market. People are distracted by the tables and money being and the zoo of animals in the very place where people were supposed to be engaging in prayer and worship. So you brought the marketplace here. The second problem is pointed out by the other gospel writers. They record this phrase that Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it into what? A den of robbers. You see, an entire unjust and corrupt economic system was exploiting this situation. If you would come into church and exchange money, we'd say, okay, here's it back now. Here's, now, now we're going to charge you double to do the exchange, right? And there was some ex exploitation going on here. And the price of the, of the animals in that market, exorbitantly high because they knew they had people over a barrel. And this whole economy had grown up around this system, and it was rich were getting richer, and the poor were getting poor on the back of the religious system. And Jesus walks in, and he turns the tables over, and he drives the animals out with passion. So here's a couple of questions. Is there a work habit or even a religious habit that is distracting me in my life with God? What activity has set up shop in that place in my heart where God wants to be. And here's the second question. What aspects of the economic system that I value and I find convenient could actually be hurting someone else, continuing the cycle of poverty and contributing to the misuse of this awesome, amazing, created planet that God's given us as a gift? Remember, number of years ago, we needed a new toaster. So I went and I found a toaster, I think it was at Target, for $4. A brand new toaster for $4. And I brought it home and I thought, I got a deal of a lifetime. I got a toaster for $4. And then I began to think, how could you possibly produce a toaster for $4? Well, I immediately realized you couldn't do it in this country. It was probably produced in another country where the people who were putting it together on the production line made a dollar a day, maybe less. And probably there had to be shortcuts taken in the process of fabricating the metal or whatever that would uh, create a toxicity for the earth's resources or abuse of them. And I thought, I, I thought I got a deal. And what I did was continue to participate in an economic system that actually continues poverty and hurts people. And I understand that I know it's a lot more complicated than this, but, but here's, here, here it is. I also know that learning to take care of the, our environment, we have, there's 8 billion of us riding on this rocket ship, we need to take care of it. We need to take care of it and be conscious about what it is. Uh, we need to be sensitive about what we buy, what economies we're supporting. Lean into fair trade products. 
microfinancing organizations that can help set the table for others in ways that simply buying the cheapest products never can. So question, is there a table, a value, a convenience, a practice in my life that needs to be flipped over in this area. And there's two books I recommend to you. I can't explain what they are, but if you're interested in this topic, Some of Small Things and The Soul of Money, just recommend those to you. Here's the second reason that Jesus is so passionate and forceful. Number two, God's grace and love are accessible to every human being on the planet. Twice in this text, it says that the money changers and sale barn have been set up in the temple courts. And in my study, apparently, this marketplace was set up in the only court in the temple that Gentiles could come and worship God in. It's as if the people were saying, Gentiles' worship of God doesn't matter. In fact, we're just going to crowd them out and take this place. It was a form of exclusion. And Jesus says, not on my watch. On, in Mark eleven seventeen, 17, he says, My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations. All are welcome here. All races, all creeds, all, everybody is welcome here. And Jesus wades in here and he says, not anymore. Not now. Not on my watch. Your religious system is denying the love and grace of God to a whole group of people that God loves. Our lead pastor, Ryan, mentioned this before, but I've thought about this a lot since he mentioned it. He says, it seems like in every generation of church life, and we're in one, God brings a group of people to the church and says, will you love this group of people? Will you love this group of people? Will you receive them and accept them? Can they belong as family members? Simply because they want to belong. Seems like every generation God's... I mean, you see it in the book of Acts, right? It was, it was Gentiles. Then you see on and on through history where God brings another group of people to church and says, will they be received here, accepted here, loved here? here. Learning to love others, as we talk about here, uh, really upsets the tables that many of us thought we had all figured out. And personally, Jesus continues to upset the table in my own life on this particular issue. Because my attitude has often been, and maybe you could, you're, you're the same way, like if that group of people stops doing those kinds of things and starts doing those kinds of things, then they can sit at our table. And Jesus says, whose table? Whose table? It's not your table, Dennis. It's not your table. It's not your table. Jesus says, it's my table, and I can welcome anybody I want to my table. And I know what that's going to mean. It's going to mean we're going to be sitting on our end of the table with our group of people that we real comfortable with, and we're going to look down there and go, whoa, them? Them? They could sit at our table? Them? And in a moment of maybe insight or whatever, we begin to realize, you know what? They're sitting at their end of the table, looking at our end of the table, and thinking, them? Them? They're welcome at this table too? Our staff got an email from a couple this past week in response to Ryan's message last, last week. And I asked them for permission. In fact, they were at the first service. Um, I asked if I could read part of it. So here's what they wrote this last week. They said, we are very grateful to be a part of Crossroads and the courageous directions you are all allowing God to take us. I work at a community health center in Greeley and see the painful results of racism, sexism, and homophobia on a regular basis. I want to be part of the healing and the solution. And the good news is, so can you. And so can I. But sometimes... In order to be a part of the healing, before Jesus is able to reset our table in a larger way, he has to upset the one that we have. A table needs flipped. And here's what we're discovering. Before the, set, the truth sets us free, it also makes us more loving. And here's the th another reason that Jesus acts so passionately. It was the time to shut down this temple and recognize the true temple. When Jesus shuts down the whole place, the religious leaders come to him and goes, what gives Jesus? What gives you the right to do this? And this is Jesus' answer. 
He says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. There's two things I want you to see from this. Number one, Jesus often said things that people under, didn't understand in the moment but only made much se more sense much later when they knew more of the story. And in this case, Jesus said that, that the true temple is me. It's my body. It's, it's me. And it's going to die, and it's going to rise on the third day. That's what he's talking about. And he's also saying is that this building and this whole religious system is unnecessary and irrelevant and in fact, over and over and over in the Old Testament, God had come to the people and said, I don't want your sacrifices. God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices. What I want is your heart. I want your heart. And in this moment, at least, Jesus shuts the whole thing down and all the attention is on him. And Jesus says, I'm the temple. I'm the temple. And of course, this doesn't make sense to them in the moment, but later it does. In fact, in my study of this passage, one author said that in the book of John, there are 30 statements that Jesus made that didn't make sense at the time. It was only later, as they got more of the story, that they began to look back and the light began to come on and they used to go, oh, ha, oh, that's, now I understand what Jesus meant by that. And here's what it means for us. <clears throat> when one of our tables gets upset, rather than reacting like, well, we got to put the table back up. we got to collect all the coins and go back to where we were. Maybe the response could be, in this case, Jesus, if this is a table that you're upsetting in my life, I know you care about it because you wept over it. I'm just going to allow the disruption for a while. I'm going to allow the, the money to lay on the stage. I'm going to allow the table to be upset for a while. I'm just going to be in this place of disruption and challenge and questioning that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. I mean, maybe you've missed something along the way. I know I've missed some things that Jesus said. Jesus was often saying, you've heard it said this. Let me tell you what I really meant by that. He does that over and over and over in the New Testament. Why would we think it ended then? Why wouldn't we understand that Jesus can come to us and go, you know, you thought that that's what I meant, but this is what I really mean because now we have more of the story. And our question is, this new idea, or this expanding idea of God, or this idea that I thought that's what the Bible said, but I'm realizing that maybe the Bible is teaching this instead, that just might be coming from Jesus. I was talking to a friend just a few weeks ago, we had breakfast, about some of these ideas of God that are being challenged in his mind, in my mind. We're being pushed, perhaps, into some uncomfortable places that we haven't been we're being, to, we're being at, uh, led to think about God in larger and more expanded ways than we ever have before. And it's pushing us. It's creating some disturbance in us, some discomfort. And I said, what, what is our normal response when that happens? And he responded to me. He said, you know what? Our normal response is like children. We like to go back to the place of safety. We like to go back to the place of comfort. We like to shut the door and keep the world out. And just kind of in a moment, I said, you know what? That is, that is the common reaction of children. But we're not children anymore, are we? Are we? And maybe it's time for some of our ideas, our beliefs, our systems to grow up a bit. Maybe it's time for that. And here's another thing that I want us to see. That the true temple, the place where humans and God connect, is in and through Jesus. It's that simple. And this is the most freeing part of the whole story. I don't have to have all the answers. I'm not God. I know that's my wife, that's a surprising statement to, for her, but I'm not. Neither are you. I mean, how could we possibly think that someday we'll have God all dialed in? We'll have God all figured out? We'll have all the theology written in the books that needs to ever be written. And I just kind of follow along. Isn't it possible? Isn't it probable? Isn't it healthy for our ideas, our thinking, our lives with God to continue to expand and expand and grow? 
time after time, Jesus comes to us and says, you don't have to have it all figured out. Some things you're going to discover later. Some things you'll know now. Go on this journey with me. I'll lead the way. The only religion you're ever going to need is me. Is me. Jesus says, I'll make it very simple. Love me with everything you have because we become most like the things that we love. And if we love Jesus most of all, we become like Jesus. And how did Jesus treat people? How did Jesus treat a neighbor? He goes, oh, I'll, I'll give you one other thing. In fact, it's the same deal. Love your neighbor. And I hope at the end of the day, wherever you are, wherever you decide to end up on some of these things, that you will be in a position of love. That somebody will say, oh, I think those people are just too loving. I want to be in that group. Don't you? Ah, it was too much. they're too loving. They brought too many along. Sometimes Jesus sets our table with a feast and the best wine around, and sometimes Jesus upsets our table in order to reset it. It's the same Jesus. It's the same Jesus. He's simply making room for a bigger Jesus, a more loving God, and some neighbors at our table that we might just be learning how to love. I want you to take a look at this video, and then we'll, I'll come back. I used to make decisions with the flip of a coin or eeny, meeny, miny, mo. My mother told me so. That was when the stakes were small, when I was small, when the world was small, back when we thought we knew it all. But you grow up quickly when you start to see that not all have the freedom to love equally or to breathe freely or to protest peacefully. And you grow up quickly when you start to see that the church is shrinking and the world is sick and people are lonely and the news won't quit. And no amount of guessing games can right these wrongs. So today I'm going to do my best to tuck my ego in the pocket of my chest. Today I will listen louder than I speak and look for the tables that Jesus is flipping. For our God carved words into stone. Our God led the people in a pillar of smoke. Our God was present in the still small voice in the middle of the storm where people rejoice. And if God was showing them the way, then I am confident God is here today. Dropping breadcrumbs and leaving signs, flipping tables where oppression dines. So yes, I admit this is harder than before. I cannot use games or to decide or keep score. I have to use faith. I have to believe that even today God is leading. My mother told me so. What is Jesus inviting us into today? Maybe, maybe it's the table that's being flipped in us. One of our tables needs to be flipped. Your understanding, experience with the Bible is, is being stretched. It's being flipped over. Being asked to look at it in ways that maybe you've never thought about before. Or maybe there's a group of people that Jesus wants to sit at our table as family. Not guess, not if or when they, but now, now. Maybe your view of God and the spiritual life is being flipped over. You've never done these 40-day Lenten journey like we're doing. Never. That's new to you. Haven't gotten in the practice of you know, doing a daily reading. There's a table being flipped in your schedule. It's like, oh, I need to, I want to take time to do that. Maybe your view of God is a little rusty, a little stayed, a little figured out. And maybe the table that's being flipped is, well, maybe, could be. Why? Yeah. Or maybe the table that's being flipped is, you know what? I need to take better care of this planet we're on. Be more conscious and sensitive to the choices that I make. Or maybe you've, you've never acknowledged or paid much attention to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ that's, that's in you. That nudge or that voice that's, that got you on 
to turn this on and watch this message, this service. Maybe you've come to our facility and you're really, this is new to you. It's like, I, I don't know about these people, and, but there's something that's drawing you. And up to this point in your life, you've been saying, not now or maybe not ever or I'm not sure. And the table that needs to be flipped is the switch that says, okay, yes. I'm going to say yes. I'll welcome that spirit, even though I don't know a whole lot about it. I've been having these conversations with this being I can't see. My, peop- my friends are thinking I'm weird. I'm hearing voices. And I'm saying it could be the voice of God. Say yes. Or maybe there's a table that it's time for you to do some table flipping. Been sitting on the sidelines. It's time to speak up, speak out, not out of anger, not out of revenge, but maybe speak up for someone who hasn't had much of a voice at this point. Or maybe it's time to be quiet and listen to a voice, as we heard last week, that's been screaming and screaming and we haven't heard it because we haven't been listening. Can we just be quiet and tamp down all those arguments in our heads why I shouldn't listen to that voice and just just allow that person to be heard in my own life? To stop with the arguments and the excuses and just allow that person's voice to come into my life. And so I really hear it. Or maybe it's time to do some weeping. What group of people or issue or relationship do I need to weep over? It happened to me this week. I was thinking about this talk and this part of this. And and I remembered this young college student who went to the University of Wyoming, which is my alma mater, who when he was in college, these two guys took him one night and they took him out and they lashed him, they tied him to a fence and they beat him and they beat him so much that he died six days later. Some of you might remember his name was Matthew Shepard. And I thought about that this week. And I thought that happened at my college. It happened in my state. It wasn't on my watch. I wasn't in school. But at the time when I heard about it, I thought, well, they shouldn't have beat him to death. But and this week I thought, what if Matthew was my son? What if Matthew was my grandson? Would it matter? What if Matthew was my brother? What is it for you? That's what it was for me. We can do this. This is a journey God's led us on together. I know some of you are going, I don't know if I want to go on this journey. (laughs) Me too. It's the Jesus that we maybe don't want, but it's the same Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, you're so loving. You meet us right where we are. You know what we think and what we live and what we do and how we act and what our attitudes are. You know all of that. And you come right in the middle of it and says, I love you. You belong. Come on, follow me. I got a better life for you. Thank you that you do.